this. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. I see Islam School joining today. Ramadan radio. Sister Lalana, you brought some blessing with you that, mashallah, <laughs> we are uh, we're seeing the benefits of. May Allah subhanahu wa taala increase. That's the you, guys, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, we have another extraordinary individual with us today, a young person from our community, and that is Sister Lalana, Marie or Murray. Which one Murray. is the right pronunciation? Murray. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, mashallah, you guys are a blessed family. Um, I've mentioned this before, I believe, on live. May I may have not. But mashallah, jihad is part of our brotherly team. Sister Lalana is part of sisterly, and she's also part of Core Academy. Man, you guys are doing incredible things, and I specifically use Sister Lalana the positive energy and the vibes that you bring. Uh, is beautiful. It just feels so Thank genuine. You. May Allah bless you. And just hint, hint. You are, just to let the people know. Uh, Sister Lalana is someone who might be even inspiring others to accept Islam, and inshallah, inshallah, maybe that could be something that could happen on live. May Allah bless and inspire your friends and make you a role model. Amin ya rabbal alamin. So, Sister Lalana, today, inshallah, we're starting Hadith 220, um, and this Hadith is brought to us by Abu Dhar Al Ghifari, rahimahullah, a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have not yet seen, and uh, his full name. Very few people know his actual name is Jundub Ibn Junada. A lot of J's in there. Uh, it's a little bit of difficult to pronounce. Jundub Ibn Junada, and he was from the tribe of Al Khifar. Now, something very interesting about Abu Dhar is that he was one of the earliest to accept Islam. And because he was one of the earliest to accept Islam, he got to spend a lot of time with the Prophet of Allah Sallam. Got lots of training, mentorship, apprenticeship. To a point that by the time Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is a Khalifa, Abu Dhar is a legit Mufti. Now you've heard the term Mufti, right, Sister Lawan? Hmm. Yeah, Mufti. Okay, but here's a point that we gotta quickly make. Notice I said he became a legit Mufti, which implies that not every companion was a Mufti. Isn't that profound to know that just because you were a companion, you weren't automatically given an upgrade to a Mufti? Uh, and you weren't a self-appointed scholar. I feel like this is something we as Muslims need to keep in mind. That like, before you start quoting halal and haram, it's it takes time. I came across a narration. Uh, forget not every companion being a mufti. To quite the contrary, one of the great scholars of Islam, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Layla, he was one of the greatest students of the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, "I met 120 companions." So he kind of knows the companion culture, if you will. He said, "I met 120 companions. Each one of them, whenever they were asked for a fatwa, they hope that the other brother of theirs would suffice them in giving fatwa." Why do you think that is, Sister Lalana? And I also asking the audience in the process, why such? A caution, if you will. Could you repeat the question for me again? Yeah, like he's uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Layla. He's like, I met 120 companions of the Prophet, and whenever they were asked for a fatwa, each hoped that the other would give the fatwa on his behalf. They're kind of like it's kind of like hot potato. Whenever they get a fatwa, they pass it on to somebody. Is like you take care of it, and they're hoping they can be off the hood. And you're wondering why such a conservative attitude. You know, what do you think? Well, I. Th- I think that there's an element of humility. I mean, these companions, Subhanallah, they're very pure um, spiritually, and um, it's obviously a very heavy responsibility to pass on a fatwa or certain yes. knowledge like that, especially them. So I think that not only is there an element of humility, but also an element of conscientiousness with yes. the faith. So I think that's why they're giving on a different response or giving off this responsibility to someone else. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, unlike coddled millennials, they didn't have an opinion on everything. Um, and you know, giving a fatwa, I hope people appreciate the gravity of it. Is actually you signing on behalf of God that this is God what God wants in this situation or that situation? And I'm walking in the hallways of Islam school, and casually people are like, "Oh, bro, that's a haram haircut. Those are some haram shorts and shoes." Do you know how casually it just rolls off their tongue? Halal, haram, halal, haram. I, I remember when I was in Dallas, uh, I would keep up, and I still kind of do because I'm a foodie. They had a Dallas halal restaurant group on Facebook. So anytime a new halal restaurant opened in Dallas, it would 
basically be posted on that group. Okay, so once a new restaurant opened up, and you know, somebody's like, oh, mashallah, new halal restaurant opened up, and somebody in the comment, comments probably a desi they're like Bra, brother is this halal or zabiha halal you know the whole question we always ask so that started like a storm of comments and crazy enough people are going on sunnah.com quran.com copying pasting translations and like ammunition everybody's making their point and you can tell no one has really actually studied or had spent time with a qualified scholar or legally qualified scholar but everybody has an opinion just sh you know just shooting it off I'm like, man, you know, you don't become a constitutional lawyer by reading the constitution, you know? Like, how can we drop the, the level of Islamic scholarship to this low? That kind of hurts sometimes. You know, I don't know if you, if, if you see that a lot. No, definitely. I definitely see that. Um, I think if someone were to go to Google and to find an article or two about a certain issue with Islam, they feel entitled to use that article and justify their claim which is wrong. I mean, like you mentioned, even with any field, um, whether it be with law, like you mentioned, or with even, even with a health issue, you can't just go to WebMD and just rely on <laughs> what WebMD says. Yeah. You have to go to a doctor and get that credible information from them. So the same thing Facts. applies. SubhanAllah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us that gravity, you know, before I think we just speak about Islam in this manner. Now, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, despite the fact he was knowledgeable, and uh, he was one of the earliest to accept Islam. There's much to talk about him. We'll try to do, just, do justice to whatever we can. Uh, but there are two themes of his life, you guys, that if you all can remember, you have a pretty good taste of his personality. So I kind of went through the bio literature, if you will, on his life, got it down to two easy to remember nuggets. So these two things, these themes come up over and over again. This is what defines him. These are his outstanding features. First thing Abu Dhar is known for, is what you can call learned minimalism. Where Abu Dhar an, was a very, like a, a minimalist to the extreme, you can say, when it came to dunya. He wanted to keep materialism and dunya at an arm's length. And he, his perspective was actually quite, quite conservative where he did not want Muslims indulging in luxuries too much. Because he had seen the early days and he had seen what the Prophet had gone through and he wanted Muslims to pre preserve the original spirit as much as possible. So he lived a very simple life and a very rugged life and he wanted to make sure people are not becoming spoiled and coddled by luxury that is coming into Muslim capital now because Islam is reaching all over the world. And towards the end of his life, he almost became a watchdog on society if he felt society was becoming spoiled with riches and materialism. So that's the first thing that we're going to explore a lot more later, learned minimalism. He was a minimalist to the nth degree. Second thing you want to know about Abu Dhar is that Abu Dhar is someone who had a very blunt personality. He did not beat around the bush. If he didn't like something, he would call you out and he would not sugarcoat it. Like a New Yorker, like he'd, just, he'd just say it. And he got into trouble for that sometimes. And I think that was his lifelong tarbiyah goal, if you will. He tried to get better. It didn't always work out as we're going to see. And companions are humans. And we see, you know, they're, they're colorful personalities. Alhamdulillah. So we're going to talk about that. Inshallah. So having given you these two things, learn minimalism and a blunt personality, let's go into his life uh, into in a, bit, a little bit of detail. I'm going to just share maybe four facts today and then that will be it. First thing that I want to share with you guys. Very fascinating. The great historian of Islam, Al-Waqidi, he says, Abu Dhar before becoming a Muslim, was a highway robber. Now, Sister Lalan, do you know what a highway robber is? Like, it's hard for us to picture today, but what comes to mind when you think of a highway robber? You know? A highway robber? That's a thing? Robber, a robber. Like, yeah. Like, you know, it's hard for us to picture because cars are going at like 60, 70 miles an hour. And like, how do you rob someone at that high of a speed? Yeah, well, back in the days, camels didn't exactly come with a V6. So... It was a little bit of a more vulnerable situation. Um, can you imagine what a highway robber would be? Like what they're like, uh, what crimes they were committing? These are people who are terrorizing caravans as, they're, as caravans are going on their trade routes. So they would lie in ambush like bandits and they would loot the caravan that's coming, especially if the caravan is defenseless. 
and vulnerable. So they would just attack the caravans, loot as much as they can. And uh, these were essentially the terrorists back in the day. And a lot of people don't know in Islam, one of the severest punishments is for those who are highway robbers who were caught because they literally start, stop the commercial engine of a society. Having said that, this Abu Dhar was a highway robber. And then Allah guided him out of it later in life. And the big lesson is, Sister Lalana, that I at least take from this, you never want to write people off. You know, you never know who was going to make the U-turn in life. In fact, we're going to see for Abu Dhar alone, he's going to make two U-turns in life. Two times he's going to have a change of heart. SubhanAllah, can you imagine a highway robber probably involved in so much loss of life and loss of resources? And Sorry. And next thing you know, he's actually Actually, someone who's guided. A lot of times, we, we, we're so quick to judge people. Omar bin Khattab, people used to say about him because he was such a fierce enemy of Islam before he became a Muslim. When people would have conversations about Omar's potential, future potential of becoming a Muslim, maybe, you know, they're just having offhand conversations. People used to say, yeah, Omar, his donkey would accept Islam before he does. You know, this is an expression to say, like, we can't even picture this. And yet, became one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Man, my teacher, uh, Saad Abdurrahman Murphy, he's, he, he used to tell us when he was in Sunday school, there were some teachers who basically uh, wrote him off as a loser, destined for failure. Like you're, they, uh, he was a little bit of a naughty kid. And <laughs> the teachers got apparently so fed up that they literally wrote him off. And uh, the way they would treat him as if he has like, he's destined to be a loser for life type of a character. And subhanAllah, Saad Murphy is like, Allah bless me with good mentors down the road who saw potential in me, pull me up. And then alhamdulillah, now we see the khair of Saad Abdul Rahman Murphi is doing. SubhanAllah, the work of the youth, the young professionals work. We are inspired here by, at ISM Core by things that Roots does and Saad Abdul Rahman Murphy does. Um, I don't know if you've come across stories like that where people were just written off and just just sized up too quickly, you know? I think what you said definitely relates to a quote by Umar um, where he says that sometimes people with the worst pasts often have the best futures. And it's very, very relevant in today's society, especially if you look into, like, for instance, the biography of Malcolm X. He mm. used to commit, according to some biographies, they say that he committed almost every sin in the book. But mm. then after he discovered Islam, his life went 360. That's a, so that's a brilliant like, example. Yeah, there is that lesson where we shouldn't be so quick to judge because you never know who you're talking to. You could be talking to a close friend of God. You just have to be careful. SubhanAllah. It's, it's, you know, we can't help but judge, but we want to be careful. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that balance. Um, so Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, despite his background, despite his past, um, he had a change of heart. This is the first change of heart that he had, where basically Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, says that later on in life, I became more religious and more spiritual. And he said, Allah guided me out of my dark path of highway robberies and just terrorizing people and harassing people. And he says something very interesting, which I wanted to share with you guys. Hadith comes in Sahih Muslim. He says that I worshiped Allah for three years before I met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now the question is, how is he, how does he even know about Allah? How is he even worshiping Allah before he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Where is that knowledge coming from? And I wanted to pose, uh, pose this question to you and also to the audience. Someone unlocked this for us. Like he hasn't met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's like, I was worshiping Allah for three years. He knows Allah by name. And uh, like, how is this even happening? Like, how do we make sense of this? Any thoughts, Sister Lana? Any theories? I think that's a great question. And to yeah. be genuinely honest, I don't know. Mm. But I'd like to see what the audience has to say. Yeah, I'm going to give you guys a few seconds. And the, the answer lies in Sirah of the Prophet Wasallam somewhere. Uh, people who took Wailab might have a little bit of an advantage. But that's a very profound question. Wouldn't it be someone close to the Prophet Wasallam? So a companion. Well, he hasn't met the Prophet for three years, so he's not yet a companion, but he somehow he says he's been worshiping Allah for three years before he met the Prophet. 
definitely he's not a prophet. He's not getting divine revelation. Where does he figure that out then? Any other thoughts, y'all? Well, where is this knowledge coming from? And you know the answer that inshallah I'm going to share? It clears up a misconception that people has about the pagans of Makkah. And that's why I wanted to make a point out of this. Okay, let's see if somebody can unlock it. Otherwise, I'm going to start slowly revealing the answer. So a lot of people think, Sister Lalana, that the pagans at the time of the Prophet wasallam, there are all these crazy polytheists who are worshipping like different mega gods and people have different deities and different supreme creators. That's actually not true. Makkans at the time of the Prophet wasallam, believed in only one supreme creator and that was Allah. And this comes in the Quran. Wala in man samawati wal ard, Allah. That if you were to ask them who originated the heavens and the earth, they would tell you Allah. They knew Allah as the supreme being and the supreme creator. Problem was that they were associating partners with Allah, middlemen with Allah, intermediaries with Allah, where they felt they could not ask Allah directly, or they were too sinful or God is too holy to reach Him directly, and therefore they went through detours. They went through deities in the middle. They felt that God had appointed for rain or for having children or for some life difficulty or issue. That was the problems with the pagans of Mecca. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he tells us that I had this natural aversion to idols. He just was not inclined to idols. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this allergic reaction that he had to the idols, he was just worshiping Allah directly guided by the innate knowledge that we're all kind of born with. And this is what we as Muslims call fitrah, very important concept, y'all. This a priori knowledge that is built inside of us, this basic sense of right and wrong, that when you do wrong, you feel guilty. When you do good, it feels good. Where you are born with a basic sense of logic, where you're born with a basic sense of morality. And similarly, you're born with this basic compass, which always points north to one higher power. He had that. And it was pure and untainted. And here you are. And here you was, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there you go. I, I wanted to really share that. And subhanAllah, you know, I was part of the dismantling doubt class that I, as you, as you know, I do for Core Academy. Uh, one thing I do, uh, I have an atheist friend who I run the arguments that I present to you guys beforehand. Because, you know, he's not someone who's afraid of throwing punches. So I was like, you know what, well, let me run the arguments. You help me refine them. And, you know, poke holes so I can, you know, patch up any uh, holes in the argument, right? So he was telling me something. Obviously, he's an atheist. He's like, you know, I have a lot of friends who used to be religious, but then over time, they came to their senses, right? And he casually dropped this on me, and it's so profound. He says, yeah, sure, a lot of these friends, when they do leave religion and they become nihilists or atheists or agnos, they go through a phase of depression where they feel purposeless, meaningless. But then he goes on to tell me that, but you know, they grow out of it and they come out stronger. I'm like, you know, that's funny you say that because people who are in crimes and they are in uh, drug cartels and they're joining gangs, funny enough, they have to go through the same conditioning process of suffering and suffocating their consciousness because they're committing crimes and they feel terrible. They commit sins and they feel terrible, but you get used to that. That's what happens in brothels. That's what happens in prostitution. You got to get used to it. Just because you're getting used to it doesn't mean you're on the right path. Because you can't deny your instincts, can you? SubhanAllah. So, um, so Abu Adhar radiallahu anhu was kind of guided to Islam uh, in two phases. One was that he's worshiping Allah on his own. And then finally, he, uh, him and his brother, they were both traveling to meet family and they ended up on the outskirts of Mecca. So his brother goes inside Mecca and he hears about the Prophet ﷺ. He comes running to Abu Dhar. He's like, you know, I think I found someone who's on the same religion as you. And this is where now Allah facilitated the path. Abu Dhar goes inside. Now his brother had warned him that the Prophet ﷺ is suffering from a smear campaign inside Mecca. So be real careful. So Abu Dhar goes in and he doesn't want to just bluntly ask, where's Muhammad? Who's Muhammad? So he says, he asks a typical Makkah and he's like, Aina Sabi. Where's the Sabi? A Sabian, which was a derogatory, derogatory term for anyone who left paganism. So 
He's like, I intentionally used a derogatory term to not raise alarms. So he's like, where's the Sabi? But still the Makkans had such hatred, unfortunately, that he, a mob like formed around him and he got stoned and harassed until he was like, I was bloodied and bruised and unconscious. And for 30 days, he was in Mecca, homeless, surviving on nothing but Zamzam water, until finally the meeting with the Prophet occurred. And he made sacrifices for the truth. You know, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you can, you, you, you've heard of convert stories and the struggles they go through, uh, shunned by family, society. Isn't it crazy? Unfortunately, yeah. Ooh, that man, 30 days just, just going through in that kind of a predicament to seek knowledge, to seek the truth. We just got to get on on Instagram, IG Live, like, you know, our job's easy. They had to travel for days and months, subhanAllah. So that was his sacrifice for the truth. And then he finally, the last thing for today, he finally met the Prophet. You're cutting off a bit for me on my end. It went a little bit mute, like I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear anything right now. Can you hear me? He went mute. I can hear you now. Okay. All right, that's good. So uh, we're back. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think no one could hear me. All of a sudden, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Hopefully, uh, uh, you guys can hear me now. Last thing I wanted to share today is that the Prophet, when he met the Prophet, he officially accepted Islam. The Prophet told him pretty soon he's going to be leaving Mecca to Medina. And... For now, go back to your tribe of Ghifar and be my representative and a teacher on my behalf. And we're told in our books that quite rapidly, nearly half of his tribe accepted Islam. And Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, eventually joined the Prophet in Medina. And from there, he would stick with the Prophet achieve the training that he did. And he's going to go down as one of the greatest companions. Uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we're going to learn more about his life in part two. I just wanted to uh, lay the foundation, uh, pave the road for a later events in his life, which are fascinating, and his struggles and his successes, inshallah. So that's all I wanted to share. Any thoughts, comments, um, Sister Lalana? I think a lingering comment that I had was that I think that there's just something more precious and special about seeing someone come to Islam as a result of coming from a background where they detested religion or they detested Islam itself, or they were trying so mm. hard to fight it, but then eventually they, they have that like that 360 um, turn or shift in their life. Yes. I think there's something more special about that than to be born with Islam, because it yeah, goes to show yeah. that the person actually went through a struggle of sorts in order to get to the truth. So true, isn't it? So true. Yeah. It was Ramadan Khattab who said, you will not taste the sweetness of Islam until you taste the bitterness of jahiliyyah, you know? So well said. for us, yeah, it's, it's like people who are born in luxury and wealth, you know, it's like, you're not gonna appreciate your, fa your father going from rags to riches, <laughs> you know? It's just like, it's very difficult to appreciate it. And that's a lot of times our fate as well. Absolutely. Which is where in, yeah, which is where seeking knowledge helps. So you can hopefully develop that appreciation. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. You guys, thank you once again for tuning in. May Allah bless you guys. Um, uh, early Eid Mubarak to all of you. Hope you guys have an amazing time with family and friends. There is a chance we might not do, we might not do a session uh, on the coming Thursday because it will be an eve of your Eid. So we'll let you know. It will be on our story. But uh, if that doesn't happen, please Eid Mubarak to you guys. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to maximize the remaining days of the hijab please make sure you fast on the 30th of july is the day of arafah hadith comes in sahih muslim forgiveness for the year before and after opportunity not to be missed inshallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you guys tawfiq sister lana thank you once again may allah bless you and your family inshallah looking thank forward you. to seeing you soon thank you so much barakallah you guys take care assalamualaikum